Good morning. I'm Kim McCleary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce our program partner, Writer's Block, for, to today's live stream with Dr. Fiona Hill and Doyle McManus. Writer's Block and the Los Angeles World Affairs Council Town Hall have had the honor of working together to welcome several distinguished authors and leading experts to our virtual forum. Today is no exception. For those of you who would be like, like who would like to ask questions of uh, Dr. Hill and Doyle McManus, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzek, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, which will start in about 30 or 35 minutes. I'm now so excited to welcome Andrea Grossman. She is the founder of Writer's Block Presents, and she will be introducing today's discussion. Andrea, it's so great working with you again. Thanks as always, Kim, um, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. In Fiona Hill's terrific new book, There Is Nothing For You Here, which I totally love, we learn about a most improbable success, a brilliant girl in an impoverished coal mining region of Northern England who defies gravity to make it to St. Andrews, then on to Harvard for a PhD in history, and ultimately to Senior Director for European and Russian Affairs on the National Security Council. Many of us were introduced to her during her extraordinary and steely testimony in the first impeachment trial. Her book is much more than a memoir. It's also a most refre refreshingly unwonky cautionary tale told from her perspective as a Russia scholar and a female one at that on how the United States faces a crisis of declining opportunity with social, economic, and political ramifications. Dr. Hill's own narrative about the difficulties inherent in her professional development as a woman in the UK, and of course here in the most elite American academic circles, runs a parallel course with her observations and hair-raising experiences in the Oval Office with the former president and his aides. There is Nothing for You Here is a riveting book about a woman whose accomplishments accompanied by her own humility and occasional disbelief at her own success, provide manifold lessons to us about equality and necessary steps to ensure our success as a nation. We urge you to visit our websites to get a copy of Fiona Hill's book through Skylight Books. They have a limited number of signed book plates, so you should get them. We've been reading Doyle McManus for years in the LA Times. From his perch in Washington, Doyle devotes his columns to issues that reverberate in national and international ways. He's done time as a White House correspondent, a Middle East correspondent, and was Washington bureau chief for 12 years. I'm so delighted to present Doyle McManus and Fiona Hill. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrea, and thank you very much, Kim. Uh, thank you, Fiona, if I may call you that, since we've known each other for about 10 years. Uh, full disclosure uh, for joining us. Thanks to all the members of the of the World Affairs Council for, for joining us this morning. Um, I want to add my congratulations on the book. Um, everything Andrea said is true. Uh, you got a remarkably warm and intriguing review in the Washington Post where their lead, uh, their lead book critic, Carlos Lozada, said, at last, a memoir by someone who worked in the Trump White House that isn't just a memoir of working in the Trump White House. And in fact, what struck me about your book is, uh, and here's my public service announcement, it's really three books in one. It is, uh, it is a memoir of a fascinating life story, beginning, as Andrea said, uh, in, uh, in effect, in the, in the, in the uh, disused coal fields of Northeast England. Um, it, it, there is embedded in it a, a mini memoir of your time in the White House with some remarkable insights about both President Trump and Vladimir Putin, which we will get to. Um, but it's also a very good book on the central problems of democracy in our time. And the final pitch is uh, it somehow manages to pull off that trifecta in a, a very accessible and appetizing form with plenty of flashes of humor. So uh, uh, all of us uh, in this meeting are used to reading books about foreign policy and national security. This will be one of the most pleasant 
reads about foreign policy and national security you'll you'll ever have. So, Fiona, thank you for joining us. Um, let me start. For those who have forgotten the halcyon days of, of the impeachment hearings of 2019, um, let me start not by asking you about the impeachment hearing, but but by reminding us of how you came to Harvard, how you came to Washington, how you landed in the Trump White House. Well, thanks very much, Don. It's really great to see you again. And sorry, it can't be in person, you know, with uh, all the COVID uh, restrictions. And I'm really grateful to Kim and Andrea and all of the staff. Jessica and others um, at the uh, Los Angeles World Affairs Council. It's it's great to be here, and thank you also to everyone who, who's listening. Um, you know, the journey that took me um, to the National Security Council and the White House um, was actually surprisingly linear in some respects because I started studying Russian, uh, which you know was the kind of main precipitating uh, reason back in 1984 um, against the backdrop of uh, the war scares in Europe over uh, the stationing of SS-20 and Pershing missiles in Eastern and Western Europe, respectively, by the Soviet Union and the United States. And um, I decided to study Russian in 1984 um, against the backdrop of what had been, um, you know, greatly anticipated nuclear uh, confrontation uh, between the two superpowers. Uh, when I got to one of my jobs in the National Intelligence Council, you know, all of the documents were declassified and discovered, in fact, we had really been on the verge of a nuclear war because the Soviet Union had completely misread the intent of a whole host of uh, US military exercises and nuclear exercises and was thinking that the United States was preparing for a first nuclear strike against it. And so everything was on alert. But the main point was that as a, as a kid then in, in high school, everything felt incredibly tense. Everyone was talking about nuclear Armageddon, uh, nuclear winter, the end of the world. It, everything seemed kind of pointless. All the political and popular culture was just filled with talk of uh, nuclear war. And I decided to go and study Russian. Um, I had this uh, idea that maybe I could become a translator. Maybe I could go and work at the UN you know, with uh, my headphones on, you know, kind of listening to interpretations at arms control or something. You know, maybe I could just do something. And that propelled me off through a various uh, series of uh, educational um, journeys, one that led after another to university, you know, as you described uh, just then, and Andrea laid out, uh, but also to the Soviet Union uh, on a scholarship at the end of the 1980s, just as Gorbachev and Reagan were meeting to sign and conclude the INF Treaty that was ending this whole period of confrontation. And also this kind of big summit that seemed to be putting Soviet and US relations on a different footing to end the Cold War. And it was there in uh, this uh, period that I uh, was present for the Gorbachev-Reagan summit uh, in uh, June of 1988. I got a job with a NBC as a stringer um, for covering uh, the uh, elections. I wasn't doing anything other than spraying Tom Brokaw's hair and making coffee for Maria Shriver. I wasn't doing anything particularly exciting uh, because actually my accent was fairly impenetrable. And although I you know, obviously claimed to speak English, which is why they gave me the job, many of the uh, camera crew and producers, I couldn't understand to what I was saying. So they assigned me to something that seemed safe, <laughs> spraying hair. Uh, and I learned then that the scholarships the United States. So I applied and I arrived in 1989 and the Cold War is ending, the Berlin Wall is coming down. So all of the Progressions are all about timing as well as educational opportunities. And fast forward along, it's that those opportunities, the timing, everything that I'm studying leads to a number of positions at Harvard itself. Uh, after graduation with the Erosia Foundation, I get a job at Brookings. And then I serve in the uh, National Intelligence Council, uh, which I think Dollar is when you know you and I met just around you know that time. And I'm the National Intelligence Officer. For Russia and Eurasia, the chief analyst for the US government, pulling together all the sources of information across the government to brief both the president and the principals, the cabinet officials and other senior officials. And that's under Bush and then into Obama. And it's on the basis of that previous job, that previous job of public service working on Russia, my work at the Brookings Institution, where I wrote a book on Vladimir Putin, which is perhaps not as enjoyable as this book, but you know, has has it has its moments. Um, I was asked then to uh, come into the Trump administration. And it wasn't as a political appointee. It was a professional you know, public service job. Um, I'd never met Trump. Uh, and in fact, some of the people who even asked me had disappeared off the scene by the time I got there, because such was the Trump administration. A lot of people got sacked in those early days. And you know, I get in there and the whole purpose uh, and point of the exercise is to 
try to do something to push back against what the Russians had done in interfering in the elections in 2016. You and I talked a lot about that at the time, before I even knew that um, I'd end up um, in the administration. And it was clear that something had to be done behind the scenes. And that's what I thought I would be doing. I never anticipated for a second that I would end up vaulted as a result of this into that publicly prominent position, certainly as a result of the impeachment. I mean, it was obvious that pretty bad things were happening, but I certainly assumed that all of my role would continue to be behind the scenes. And like my initial ideas of you know doing something to study Russian and perhaps you know interpret for an arms control uh, ag agreement or something like this, you know I find myself in the maelstrom um, instead uh, of doing what I thought would be you know kind of a facilitating job, coordinating policy towards Russia and also Europe at the National Security Council. Well, in in fact, as I recall, when you were when you were asked to join the NSC. And you're quite right. You were a political appointee. In fact, in the book, you mentioned that you had marched in the Women's March uh, around the time of President Trump's inauguration, only to get called for, I think, for an interview at the NSC the next day. So that, that, that such was the, the cultural uh, 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 distance there between where your head was and where theirs. But you were hired in large part, I used to enjoy describing you in columns as America's leading Putinologist. You were, you were, you were uh, uh, hired in part as a Putinologist. They needed to figure out Vladimir Putin in order to, to chart a sensible Russia policy. So let's start a little bit with the policy part. I promise we will get back to the north of England in a few minutes. Um, and I want to ask, for your quick, not quite your elevator version, a little longer than that, but so what is it that makes Putin tick? What is it that makes Donald Trump tick? And what was it that made for that very strange on and off bromance between the two? Yeah, that's um, a, a good trifecta of questions there. Um, Vladimir Putin is really a man of his times. And, you know, of course, he initially made it very difficult for us to figure out what made him tick. When I was at the National Intelligence Council, you know, it was evident there was remarkably little information about him because this is a man who had risen up the dark corridors of power through the KGB, um, always, you know, trying to make sure that he was, as George Bush put it, misunderestimated and that nobody would ever, you know, kind of figure out who he was and what he was after. He hid his ambitions and any ideas that he had very closely. And when he was selected as president to replace Boris Yeltsin, I mean, very uh, definitely selected to do this. The people who selected him as the replacement thought he was going to be their puppet. Somebody who was also, as a former secret policeman, going to keep their secrets safe and also enable them to hold on to lots of ill-gotten gains and, you know, not be prosecuted or anything else after they left, um, along with Boris Yeltsin from the political scene, having stashed away and taken off kind of a lot of the resources of Russia. Well, Putin turned out to be something quite different from what those people had initially uh, anticipated, because he was a man, as I said, who hid a lot about himself. But even you know, large bits of his biography were either you know mythologized or just you know out of sight. And when my colleague Clifford Gaddy and I from the Brookings Institution tried to kind of figure out how to write about him when I did come back after the National Intelligence Council, feeling you know rather dissatisfied with the depth of understanding of Putin, we had to start thinking about the larger context. You know, the man of his times, what, what would make him tick in the context, you know, kind of based on the, the bare facts of his biography that we knew, the information about him we knew, what, what would that tell us if we kind of delve deeper into the larger, um, you know, environment around Putin, where he came from, the kind of family he grew up in, the people that we knew he associated with, what little bits of biographical information that we had. And we kind of came up with this kind of multifaceted approach to him and discovered, you know, indeed, this man was definitely a product of uh, the time and the circumstances. And he's also, very importantly, of course, a KGB agent. We say former KGB agent, but you never really leave the mothership. And he has adapted every single one of the dirty tricks uh, and the ruthlessness that he learned in the, the KGB in Leningrad in the 1970s in particular, where you know, he was also involved in honey traps and sting operations against American and Western business people and all kinds of other things that he's learned along the way. And he's adapted them to be the politician that we see today. And when people have asked Vladimir Putin, what's your greatest skill, he says, working with people, which of course means manipulating people, blackmailing people if necessary, but really knowing how to induce people to do things you want them to do. So that's Vladimir Putin in the very quick 
Alberta uh, you know, version, but there's also Putin who sees himself as kind of the epitome of the Russian state, and that's also important too. He's kind of made himself into a new czar, of Vladimir the Great, and there's been Vladimir the Great before, <laughs> and he's always trying to cloak himself in this mantle of the great emperors and empresses, um, Catherine the Great, uh, for example, and, and the you know the great Soviet leaders of the, of the of the past. So he's somebody who sort of cloaked himself in the the garb of the state and all the kind of legacies of, of, of Russian history. Very different, obviously, from Donald Trump, who knows very little about U.S. history, certainly almost nothing about world history, and um, is also, however, a man of his context and times. And I found myself, once I got into the uh, White House, in a way approaching Trump in the same way, because, you know, his public and private personas are just the same. You know, everything that everybody saw about him on the campaign trail, he's like that in private. He's a showman. He's into reality TV. There's, it's all artifice. And I kept thinking to myself, well, there must be something else beneath that. I mean, like Vladimir Putin, you know, in a way he's all show because Putin became all show because he wanted other people to think different things about him. And Putin dresses up in all kinds of crazy costumes. I mean, we've all seen him as, you know, he, he did he did train to judo, the judo outfit, ice hockey, trained himself to play ice hockey, he's off there in his ice hockey kit. You know, he's, he's bare chested when necessary, swimming across Siberian rivers. He, he dresses up in a funny white suit to fly and a, and a little electrolyte aircraft to bring endangered cranes home. He's then he's a fighter pilot, you know, complete with all the kit there, you know, in a plane, um, you know, trying to douse forest fires. I mean, you know, Vladimir Putin has put on the costume to be it. Trump never changes his costume. He's always in the same suit, perhaps with a different tie. But he's always trying to be something for everybody. He, he, he's always kind of playing to the crowd at all, at all different times. So there's that kind of element in there as well. And. Trump, like Putin, is really a kind of a product of the 1980s. And I have a section in the book called 80s Man, because Trump's whole worldview seems to have been shaped by the 1980s. For Vladimir Putin, the 1980s was one of loss, because that's the period when the Soviet Union loses its position. He's stationed in Dresden in East Germany, and East Germany falls apart while he's there. And when he returns you know, to uh, Moscow after his time in Dresden, the Berlin Wall's come down, and you know, East Germany is no more. The Soviet Union collapses in a matter of time and he feels like he's lost his position, although that loss enables him this great gain later on to become the president of, uh, of Russia. But Trump doesn't feel that sense of loss. In the 1980s, he was at his peak. The United States was arguably at its peak as well. But he's always kind of trying to head off the idea that the United States or he might be displaced in some way. You know, so you've still got all the obsessions of the 1980s, the rise then of Japan rather than China, tariffs and protectionism and all the kind of the, the debates that took place in the economy, the debates about America's, the cost to America of stationing troops overseas, and then the arms control nuclear um, concerns, actually the same ones I had as a kid, you know, I was thinking about the war scare. Trump talked all the time about the nuclear weapons. He had an uncle who was at MIT and a nuclear physicist, and he kind of gave uh, the impression all the time that because of that genetic link, he somehow knew all there was about nuclear weapons. And he would talk about this all of the time. And, you know, kind of that was actually one of the motivating factors for him, a driving force, which you know people missed most of the time, that he actually wanted to sit down when he said, I want to have a deal with the Russians. He wanted to have a deal on arms control. He wanted to wrap up the 1980s, the INF, you know, treaty that I'd seen Gorbachev and Reagan signing when I got to the Soviet Union as a student. He actually, you know, he didn't want to rip that up and that happened, but he wanted his own big super duper Trump treaty. You know, if we'd renamed the, the START treaty, the super Trump arms, you know, kind of regulation treaty or something like that, he would have been thrilled because he wanted to put his stamp on uh, that relationship between the US and Russia. And that feeds into this strange bromance in some way because Trump was concerned with Putin, not with Russia, he thought that he was the special source that if he sort of sat down and turned on his charm on Vladimir Putin, he would turn things around and be able to achieve those arms control deals that eluded you know, people in the past. If people look back to that period of the 1980s, Trump actually offered himself to Reagan as an arms control negotiator in you know, kind of, um, sort of public ads in newspapers and magazine interviews. He famously tried to kind of chase Gorbachev around New York to try to meet with him you know, at one point when Gorbachev came um, on a visit later. And he was always kind of pretty convinced that, again, that he was the person who could make this happen because, you know, his charisma was so overwhelming and that, you know, Putin wouldn't really be able to resist him. And Putin was also the type of leader he wanted to be, which, of course, is pretty disturbing, you know, kind of given who Putin is and coming from the KGB, because he wanted to be that strong man strutting along the stage who was 
fabulously wealthy, fabulously powerful, fabulously famous. And, you know, he was always kind of looking to Putin in a way to sort of reflect, you know, on, onto himself. But the big difference between Trump and Putin gets into those points that I made before, because Trump didn't want anything to do with the state. He didn't rise up through the state apparatus, certainly not through uh, the... Um, you know, the corridors of the KGB, he rose, he, he rose up through a different kind of state, real estate, you know, from the outside. You know, basically, he's the wild card candidate, the outsider, the always the outsider. And he doesn't want to govern at all through the, the state, uh, unlike Putin. He doesn't put the state first. He doesn't see himself bearing any legacy or any history. He's always trashing previous presidents. I mean, he's even disparaging Reagan and, and Lincoln. He's not a Republican. He isn't the manifestation of his party. He is a, basically a one-off. Um, in his view and actually and also in reality. And so what he what interests him about Putin is that one-off element. Whereas Putin is is very much steeped in Russian interests in this long state tradition and this you know kind of legacy of Russia as a big empire and a and a state. And and Trump's all well I, he doesn't really care about America. It's all about me, myself, not really America first. And his view of American history and what America is 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 pretty warped. It's it's nothing that most of us would really recognize unlike putin who has a very clear view of what russia is and, and it really kind of gels with you know anything that others have you know taken away from russian history so uh, i take it that your conclusion uh, about the to the to the ancient question among befuddled americans does putin have something is there some compromising material that putin has on trump your conclusion was actually no trump actually admired the way Putin ran things. Yeah. I mean, Putin, let's be um, honest, probably has compromising information on, on everybody who's ever been, you know, through Russia because <clears throat> the KGB, then the FSB, the SVR, all the kind of acronyms, you know, the secret uh, police, they kept files on anyone who came their way. You know, when I was a student there, you know, I experienced firsthand the, the massive surveillance state. People would break in on the phone calls with my parents. You know, at one point I was telling my mom and dad that there was nothing to eat in the um, cafeteria at the, um, at the institute I was studying in and I was pretty hungry. And suddenly a voice came in and said, you know, in Russian, girl, if you keep on talking to your parents like that and telling them this, you won't have another phone call with them. I was like, oh, OK. And, you know, we had, you know, a woman um, called a Dijon, a, a woman who was kind of in charge of, of our corridor in the place that we lived. And they kept it. She kept a book of our comings and goings and everything that we did. And at all times, you know, we'd be having people following us around. You know, so you've got to, you know, bear in mind that the Russians will have something on everybody. But the point with Putin is that you don't have to use that if you know how to work with people. You figure out other vulnerabilities. You don't necessarily pull out the compromising information. So it's almost, it's not irrelevant, but the main point is he knows how to manipulate. And he immediately got Trump's number, like pretty much everybody did, thin-skinned, uh, you know, in, incredibly susceptible to flattery and, you know, somebody who only, you know, thinks about himself. And so that's what Putin would hone in on. And I saw it time and time again. He knew how to push Trump's buttons to get him going. The, the, the most surprising single fact about that period that I found in the book is one you, you mentioned a few minutes ago, and that is that President Trump was genuinely passionate about the issue of nuclear weapons, not only in the sense you mentioned that he'd love to have his name on a treaty, he'd love to have a, a, a success, a pelt to hang on the wall, but that he really felt deeply that, that nuclear arms control was necessary and even steeped himself in some of the details. But, and I'd love you to pick up the narrative and talk about the, the Helsinki summit in 2018 where uh, to some degree, those of us in the media and in the public misunderstood everything that was or most of what was going on there. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem um, on, on many fronts with Trump was he was just so lacking in self-discipline. And he was all about himself, but not the discipline bit of it. I mean, basically, he, he couldn't follow through even on a plan that he himself had devised and agreed on. And we just saw this time and time again. He, he would, you know, um, I, I sometimes just wondered how on earth he made it in his business. Um, and, you know, there are lots of stories about how he didn't at times because he just wouldn't follow through on things and he wouldn't do the homework necessary, even on things that mattered the most to him. 
And on nuclear weapons, I mean, he did pay a lot of attention to the briefings. He was always talking, uh, if anyone was actually listening about it, about a briefing that had really, you know, got his attention about what would happen in the event of a, a, a of a nuclear uh, missile explosion. I mean, I guess that's the, you know, the, the the warning briefing that people give. You know, you, here you are, you've got the button, the codes. Before you press that, just remember this, you know, kind of um, before you take this step, nuclear arm again. This is what it looks like, and that had really done a number on him. He would constantly say, "I have this briefing." And you know, talk about granite melting and all that. And he, for him, and he'd say it over and over again. Again, nobody was really listening because they were looking always at something else about him. He would say that for him, nuclear weapons and a nuclear war was the ultimate catastrophe. And this tied together Russia, North Korea, and Iran for him. Um, he was actually, you know, very focused on Kim Jong Un and trying to avert, you know, Kim from trying to shoot off a missile. He wasn't very good at following up and getting an all-encompassing arms uh, agreement um, and uh, denuclearization agreement with Kim. Uh, but he was, uh, with Kim Jong-un, very focused on diverting the guy's attention. He did that quite successfully, I think, and ought to be given some credit for it. With Iran, he wasn't as interested in regime change as most of the rest of his people around him were. He was more interested in making sure that the Iranians also didn't get a missile, and constantly talked about that too. But again, that was just lost in the noise of him pulling out of the nuclear agreement with Iran and getting into a fight with our uh, European allies about that. But on the arms control you know, front, with Putin, there were many failed attempts to actually get serious negotiations going for uh, what would happen after INF, um, because we were in a fight all the time about who was doing what in INF, and it was becoming obvious it was no longer tenable. Only the United States was adhering to the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, and the Russians had been violating it for, for ages. And then what would happen with the new START Treaty that was signed in 2010 and was about to expire and needed to be renegotiated? And Trump was, again, what I said, interested in having this big omnibus new treaty with his name all over it. But he was genuinely interested in the impact. I think, you know, if he could, he would he's, he would have done what Reagan, you know, was rumoured to have wanted to do, along with Gorbachev at one moment, which is negotiate away all nuclear weapons. But of course, it's not the Soviet Union and the United States anymore. There are lots of other nuclear states, Pakistan, India, China, and all the would-be, you know, states uh, like Iran and um, North Korea, for example. So that wasn't really very realistic. But he'd had this serious discussion in Helsinki. The reason that Helsinki was chosen for that summit was because of its role in the past with people like um, Bush, Herbert Walker Bush and Gorbachev meeting there. I mean, it, like Reykjavik, Helsinki was one of the traditional places for summits of the past, of the 1980s and you know, 90s and so. And so he wanted you know, to have that big nuclear summit. And so when he came to the press conference, he was thinking he would get a lot of praise for actually dealing with this issue. And when people were asking him, do you think Russia is still targeting us? They were, of course, thinking like 2016. He was thinking targeting with missiles. He was thinking like the bulletin of atomic scientists, you know, kind of one minute to midnight and that he thought he pushed it back a bit. It was tragic watching it because his headspace was totally different from what everyone else's was. And rightly so, because everybody else was so worried about what had happened in 2016. They were worried about the idea that Trump and Putin were having this conversation behind the scenes. They were all worried about who was saying what was Trump calling him out on 2016, which of course he wasn't, uh, but he was, you know, talking about some of the arms control issues, among other things. And then the whole press conference immediately went where it was predictable. I thought it was a terrible idea to have one. Of course, that was for Trump, the big show. He wanted the press conference. He wanted to be seen with Putin. He wanted to get universal acclaim for doing the thing that big strong men presidents do and talking about nuclear weapons. He wanted to be, you know, Reagan and Bush and Gorbachev and all of this all rolled into one. And of course, that didn't happen. He gets questions on the thing he least wants to be questioned about, and he kind of has a meltdown. It's not quite a nuclear meltdown, but it did have that kind of nuclear catastrophic impact in terms of this massive humiliation of him and of the whole country on the world stage when he basically says, I believe Vladimir Putin over Dan Coates and my intelligence community on who did what in the 2016 election. Which, as you say, was an entirely predictable question that his press secretary should have talked him out of doing the press conference, not the Russia expert on the NSC staff. But here's my uh, counter historical question. If he had followed your advice and said, all right, no, no, no press conference, we'll just end up going down that blind alley, would history have turned out different on the nuclear side? Well, perhaps. But also perhaps not. In fact, more likely not, because, you know, there were then later on uh, problems that got in the way of, um, you know, these negotiations. And again, it was a lack of follow through, a lack of commitment to it. Um, and I mean, commitment to sticking to the plan of how you were going to unfold the negotiations. I mean, I write in the book that he essentially ran out of runway. 
also that was the Russians too, because the Russians did plenty of things. It wasn't just the Helsinki press conference. We were supposed to meet um, in uh, Paris, you know, for example, to have a meeting and that, that all kind of went awry. Not really because of uh, the, um, the Russians in this case, but because the French um, had designs on turning the, it was the armistice um, uh, commemorations of 100 years of the end of World War One, and the French wanted to hold a big Paris peace conference rather than just focus on the armistice. And we could have had a meeting behind the scenes using, you know, that idea of the end of World War One is another way of moving the arms control forward. So that didn't work. And then we were supposed to meet and uh, have discussions in Argentina during the G20, and the Russians seized the uh, Ukrainian ships and sailors in the Kerch Strait just before that. I mean, literally on the eve. And that was that. We couldn't have those meetings. So there were plenty of other things that got in the way. And again, eventually, we ran out of runway. Eventually, um, there is um, an arms control negotiator assigned to Marshall Billingsley, but he just doesn't have the time uh, to be able to pull off uh, what he was supposed to. Okay, one, one last big topic before we go to uh, the very patient members of the World Affairs Council for their questions. Um, and this going back to, uh, to the, the, the arc of your life, you lived and worked in three countries, uh, the UK, uh, the United States, and Russia. And from those experiences, you drew to me a very um, arresting and compelling set of parallels. Three big industrial countries, all of which, in, in each of which, in effect, the, uh, the social contract with ordinary working families has been broken one way or the other. In the decline of, of industrial Britain, in the Great Recession in the United States, obviously in the collapse of the Soviet Union and the awful uh, economic collapse that followed that. And in each of those countries, uh, the reaction was populism and the rise of populist leaders in different contexts, with different histories, with somewhat different outcomes. But please just play that theme out a little bit and what what lessons can we learn if any are there any positive examples out there of countries that have uh, come out of these scarring processes uh, with uh, their democratic systems intact I don't know that we have a, a lesson to learn from Russia at this point but uh... well first of all I mean a lot of these observations are from my you know rather um, unusual vantage point. It's not an unusual vantage point for lots of people in the world who, you know, come from the working or middle classes. But, you know, as it's more unusual from someone from, you know, my kind of background to get uh, into sort of elite educational or government positions, you know, most people are looking from the top down rather than the bottom up or the bottom, you know, kind of on a horizontal level, which is what I was doing. So, you know, I say in the book that I was very much attuned to industrial decline because I was a product of it. My father had lost multiple jobs in the coal mines after one mine after another closed down. Then he tried to work in the steelworks, that closed down. Then he went to work at brickworks, that closed down because it was a brickworks making bricks, not for housing, but for factories and, you know, kind of, you know, the repairs of, you know, major industrial enterprises. And then eventually becomes um, a hospital porter in the National Health Service. But it's like, the you know, the bottom of the economic rung. And I have all of these uh, grants and opportunities and scholarships. And when I get to, you know, Russia in 1987, 1988, Russia was just one big, or the Soviet Union, one big giant blue collar working class country. It's the socialist, you know, kind of union of workers and peasants. So, you know, everyone's either a peasant, you know, in the agricultural, you know, collective farms or they're a worker. And the Communist Party has given people social mobility through the body of the party. You know, Mikhail Gorbachev grew up in an agricultural area. Um, uh, Nikita Khrushchev was a coal miner at one point and, you know, defined himself as, as that out in the Donbass in the, in the mines of uh, Ukraine. And all of the Soviet leaders had come from the working classes, you know, from the masses. I mean, that was part of their shtick, you know, kind of how they got ahead. And so it was immediately, you know, kind of apparent to me how similar they were. And I was shocked, and I you describe this in the book, about how Moscow looked more like my hometown and the, the mining village of my grandparents that had been totally run down was falling apart in 1987, 1988, then it looked like, you know, the glittering capital of a major superpower. I mean, all the cultural aspects were there, but Moscow was just a big town on it hard times. And so I immediately saw that. And then when I came to Harvard in 1989, just, you know, on the back of uh, this year um, in Moscow, Harvard, you know, Harvard Yard, amazing, you know, all these incredible facilities, top, you know, global university, we only had to do was walk outside Harvard Yard and outside of the realm of the 
a graduate student or undergraduate dorms and see the rest of Boston and East Cambridge and Somerville and Medford and all these places that had once been industrial centers. Boston's an industrial town and all those industries were closing down as well. There was high unemployment and people were renting out their houses that they'd bought for their family to students because, you know, they, uh, they'd lost their income. And, you know, this is just boarded up factories all over the place. All I did was walk around and just look and say, oh, gosh, this is like home as well. You know, how, how interesting is this? And, of course, I'm studying this history all the time. So my own personal observations and data points in the history I'm studying, the political uh, classes I'm taking. I take a, a class with Janusz Kornai, a famous Hungarian professor who had been uh, the economist behind the idea of, you know, goulash communism in Hungary, you know, the kind of more reformed uh, communism of kind of trying to bring some private enterprise into things. And he was written, writing a book about the road to a free economy. And he'd also written a book about the economies of shortage, which is about all the deficits in central planning and the failure of central planning. And I'd experienced all that at real first hand in the Soviet Union. And he was talking about how difficult it was going to be for this transformation of Eastern Europe. And when I went to talk to him, because I was having a hard time with some of uh, the concepts that he uh, was explaining, because I'd never taken economics before, he talked about my home background in the northeast of England and actually put it in context where I realized, hey, the northeast of England was also a centrally planned, you know, nationalized economy, because all of the industry there had been nationalized, taken over by the government after World War II, when the private sector couldn't rebuild it after the devastation of the war. And so I suddenly realized I was living in the same experience as the Soviet Union in a real sense, from an economic sense. And so all of those uh, viewpoints for me, that academic um, your research, uh, analysis, all of the opportunities that I had helped me put it into the context and the frame. So from a very early period, I was very attuned to this. And then I found that that followed me through with my research. I became very interested in looking at deindustrialization in Russia after the fall of, um, uh, of the Soviet Union. And I wrote a, a book, again, you know, kind of perhaps not the best read, you know, for a kind of a, a nighttime or a cocktail party uh, about Siberia and the Siberian curse which was uh, basically about deindustrialization, all these mega cities that had been built in Siberia, a million people strong around factories and mines and steelworks. And in uh, the 1990s, these places had collapsed and people were just stuck there and they were really stuck. It wasn't just like my parent, grandparents' mining village in the north of England. These people stuck miles and miles away, thousands of miles away from the rest of Russia. And all of their livelihood has disappeared as well. And, you know, th this was kind of part of the exercise of trying to understand this. And so that's how I came to bring this vantage point forward, because I'm not looking at it from the top down. I'm looking at it from the bottom up. And it's the shock of familiarity that really attracts me to all of this. And I for years tried to explain this and people would just brush it away because it wasn't it didn't fit in with you know anybody else's analysis because they're just not seeing it. And so, you know, I, I finally thought I needed to explain all of this because this is how it breaks out into these populist politics. Where are all the places that voted for Trump in 2016? It wasn't people sitting in the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. It was people, you know, in Pennsylvania and, and Michigan and, you know, kind of Wisconsin and Ohio and places in Rust Belt cities that look a lot like Siberian cities that have been abandoned or northeast of England cities that have been abandoned. Those northeast cities in the north of England, I mean, they, they vote for... Brexit and then they vote for the Tories later or they vote for the UK Independence Party to you know kind of move away from Europe to bring things home and in Russia in these big old industrial cities they vote for Vladimir Putin. Let's get some questions from the audience and for that we have our question wrangler Jessica Duganzic. Jessica. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Yes, we have so many questions coming in. Thank you so much, uh, Doyle and Dr. Hill. It's great to have you back at the Council and with Writer's Block, our partner. Uh, the first question I've gotten about three or four times. So do you think that Putin has dirt on Trump? And if so, what do you think it is? Well, it's like I said in um, answer to Doyle's, yeah, he has dirt on Trump, but we do too, right? We have the Access, Access Hollywood tapes. We have loads of women who've come forward to complain and uh, put cases against what things that Donald Trump has done. We have evidence that he hid his um, his tax returns. Um, it took his niece, Mary Trump, you know, there's lawsuits going backwards and forwards to reveal all of these. We've had investigative journalists poring over, you know, all of the accounts of um, his companies. We have cases going through the Southern District of New York looking into things uh, about Trump. I mean, so, you know, we have dirt on Trump as well. And I mean, that, this is why, you know, in the book and in other things I've said, 
you know, I keep trying to encourage people not to dwell on that too much. Because, you know, the other thing is Putin didn't need to use any of that if they had any of it. And again, they've got dirt on everyone. They'll have dirt on Bernie Sanders and Bill Clinton and other people who went to Moscow, you know, in that time frame. They'll have, they'll have recorded and surveilled anything that anyone else did because they do that for everybody. And I experienced it firsthand the first time that I was there. Everything is surveilled, it's an all surveillance state. So yes, but the fact is when we look for that all the time, we think that that's what he was holding over him. You know, we kind of sometimes missing the point of what's happening. I do think there is one element that, you know, I didn't really mention in the book because, you know, I don't know enough personally about it, but Trump really did obviously want to build Trump Towers in Moscow. I mean, he talked about this all the time. And so he had this aspiration and it's was a part of this attraction to Putin, right, Dodd? I mean, he knows that Putin is the guy who makes things happen. And we know from the reports of his, you know, former lawyer, Michael Cohen, and many others in, you know, the kind of the Trump circles, he was constantly caught in Putin as he had with the, the previous, you know, leaders, because he wanted to build something going back to the 1980s again in Moscow. He wanted to have his name, Trump, 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 all over something big in Moscow. And so there was that, that kind of attractive, an element that, you know, an inducement of kind of like dangling out there the prospect of being able to do that, you know, when he was no longer in the presidency or wanting to do it beforehand. And that might have been an element in why Trump is so obsequious to Putin as well, because he doesn't want to ruin, you know, the, the prospect of, you know, having a nice gleaming building there, you know, at some point. Thank you. Um, are you regularly harassed online or elsewhere? With respect to your former position, um, what has personally been the most alarming or scariest part? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of nasty things said out there um, on the internet and Twitter. I've, I don't have a Twitter account deliberately because of that, although people keep pushing me to have one. There's a fake one set up um, in my name at one point, posting strange things. Um, there's lots of fake versions of my book going around, actually, also on Amazon, so God knows what they say inside. But there's, you know, lots of uh, terrible things, you know, were, were written about me at various points. The most disturbing was actually when I first joined the administration. Um, in uh, 2017, I relate that in the book, where I immediately find myself on Infowars. This is, you know, really early on in my time there, and with Alex Jones and Roger Stone going after me. And that's disturbing because those guys really can whip up a storm. I mean, Alex Jones, think about, you know, what he did to the families of Sandy Hook and how he harassed them and terrorized them for years and many other people besides and just the things that he has purported. He's been sued. But, you know, he, he always claims free speech and, you know, you can you can go out there and, you know, pretty much say anything about anything, anybody you want. The, the only point is when people are stopped is when it often is too late, when this turns into some physical assault. And so after this happened and around the time of the testimony um, and the impeachment trial, you know, I did get warnings from people that I was setting the Twitter sphere alight and that, they, you know, the trolls were out and all kinds of you know, terrible threats were being made you know, for harm. And I was advised, you know, to take every precaution with my mail, get some security cameras. I talked to the local police and they said, well, we can't do anything until somebody actually crosses the threshold of your door. Unless, you know, you put do not trespass signs absolutely everywhere right up until your door. You know, these wow. are all kinds of the problems. Basically, I mean, I'd like to say that every single one of us out there could be susceptible to this. It's one of the reasons that we know we need to push back against this kind of behavior on the internet. I mean, I'm just as susceptible to any other woman in a public um, uh, outward facing capacity or a kid in school who's being cyber bullied or, you know, Doyle as, you know, somebody who's writing articles. I mean, the, the Internet is awash with horrible derogatory comments because, you know, people find it very easy with no penalty to do things to people in you know, a doxing, swatting. You know, we have to you know work very hard as a society to push back against this. I mean, it's just disturbing to me overall that there is that pattern. And even before, you know, the advent of the Internet, I mean, I, I recall early on when I was at the Kennedy School at Harvard and I'd go on C-SPAN or something, I, I kept a Looney Tunes, you know, kind of file, which, you know, kind of, you know, was made to sound humorous, but sometimes was not because I could get some really threatening letters through the mail because people had to resort to old, you know, old style mail to, to reach you. Crazy. Uh, looking into history, Russia, the United States and the UK were allies during major world events. Do you see Russia leaving the West and allying herself with China in the 21st century? Yeah, I mean, Russia's um, alliance with the, the West has always been really out of expediency. I mean, Russia, I mean, this really is parts of Europe. Um, it always has been in terms of its um, you know, political and um, 
social and certainly dynastic <laughs> ties in the past. Uh, the, I mean, the emperors and empresses of uh, Russia were often European, you know, certainly at least part by marriage and birth. But in the case of Catherine the Great, she was a German. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't even a Russian, she was German, you know, so, I mean, there was always, you know, these ties, you know, everybody related to Queen Victoria, you know, for example, but, you know, when Russians, uh, from the Russian elite and the aristocracy went to study, they went to study in Germany or France or, you know, the United Kingdom, Peter the Great, when he first famously went on a world tour, including, you know, working for a while in a Dutch shipyard and, you know, one in the, in the United Kingdom when he wanted to build the Russian Navy, they were always looking to the West and to Europe you know, for innovation and for kind of new ideas and tools. But they were never really part of it. They were never part of the West. Um, they've made their whole history you know, based on that feeling and, and uh, reality of separation, the vast, huge Eurasian step, you know, different history. They didn't get the Romans, you know, they had the Mongols. The uh, Napoleon tried to invade, pushed back by the Russian winter. You know, there's this great kind of sweep of history and vast distance. And they've always, of course, you know, bordered on the East long, long way away from Moscow, but a lot of the territory that Russia seized in the Russian Far East up into the Pacific was once China in the 1860s, east of Lake Baikal and north of the Amur River. So there's a lot of anxiousness about China in the um, in Russian psyche and also in, in Russian politics. They were very quick to sign a major uh, partnership and uh, border agreement with China. And I think that the answer to this question is that Russia really wants to have a partnership with China because Russia, like everyone else, sees China as a great rising power. Russia does not want to be in any way pitted against China, it doesn't want the West to push Russia against China or try to pull Russia over to the West against China. It does not want to tangle with China. It wants to have a, a major partnership. It's not clear that the Chinese want that quite so much. I mean, for now, you know, it's very useful for them and you know, for China to be uh, closely associated with uh, Russia politically. But, you know, economically, Russia is now dwarfed by China. And if Russia wants innovation and, and wants to still have kind of an independence in its own innovation and own economy, it's going to come more from the relationships with the West. But that doesn't, you know, kind of seem particularly likely at the moment. So for the foreseeable future, Russia absolutely wants to have this major partnership with China. And there's elements that are against the West. But I think, you know, it depends a lot on what China does. If at any point there's any re return to tensions, you know, maybe, maybe inadvertently, Russia may want to, as it always has in its history, look back a bit to the West to kind of balance balance the two sides off. It's kind of trapped by this giant territory and its history. Okay. How much did Trump immerse himself in strategic nuclear modern, modernization? His administration oversaw a revamping of the modernization program. Was he involved? He was very keen on the idea of modernization. Um, I mean, he was a very much a proponent of making sure that the nuclear arsenal was the best it could be. I mean, sometimes he'd have these sparring matches with Putin about, I might get this missile before you might get it. And Putin said, no, no, I'm not so sure, Donald, but you will get it, you know, kind of thing. There'd be these little back and forth on this and a bit of gamesmanship on it. But in terms of the details, I mean, I'm pretty confident he was informed of the details, but that was delegated down to, you know, the experts within uh, the United States government. As I said, I'm pretty confident that if he thought he could, he would have actually negotiated away nuclear weapons, just given the way that he thought about it. I mean, it was almost like a nuclear zero outlook. He thought uh, of the idea of having nuclear weapons and using them as catastrophic. Whereas Putin's like, ah, I have nuclear weapons. Maybe I can figure out how to use them. I don't think that was ever crossed, um, you know, Trump's mind. But, you know, in the spirit of, you know, the, the old Reagan approach of, you know, you have to kind of, basically always negotiate from a position of strength. Trump wanted the nuclear arsenal to be modernized. What did you think of NATO's expansion efforts and Russia's reactions? Well, Russia's reactions were 100% predictable uh, from NATO expansion because uh, Russia never thought that NATO had morphed from being the Cold War adversary and uh, into a kind of more of a, a liberal democratic club. I mean, there were, there were periods when, of course, we tried to entice Russia into uh, joining NATO in the early 1990s. And that idea was, you know, kind of bandied around as part of the kind of post-Cold War interactions um, with, with Russia. But of course, you know, that was not particularly realistic after a certain point. And after 1999, when NATO um, under US leadership bombed Belgrade, during the standoff, you know, after the collapse of Yugoslavia over Kosovo and the atrocities that the Serbs were carrying out, 
um, I was in actually happened to be in St. Petersburg at the time, and everyone in uh, the Russian political spectrum immediately saw NATO as the enemy again, because they thought, well, if NATO could bomb Belgrade, why couldn't they bomb, you know, Moscow, for example, in the advent of a of a conflict? And this was also against the backdrop of Chechnya and the war in Chechnya, and you know, kind of these fears that started to kind of grow up in Russia that maybe. Moscow could get bombed because of atrocities in Chechnya, for example. So, you know, there was always in Russia a great deal of anxiety about NATO. And the push to enlarge NATO came from Poland, the Baltic states, and others who, you know, had similar anxieties about Russia. I personally wasn't a big fan of the idea of the enlargement of NATO. Um, you know, there was one thing also with, uh, you know, the push idea, um, you know, from Poles and Bolts and others. But, you know, I was of the kind of the view that, Others, you know, much more senior than me, were that this was inevitably going to antagonise Russia, and so we'd have to think very long and hard about how it was going to be managed, not rushing into it. People like George Kennan, you know, who'd written, you know, the famous Long Telegraph, uh, Long Telegram, was opposed to the expansion of NATO. And my history professor, Richard Pipes, who was my dissertation advisor, an old Cold Warrior, you know, who famously worked on the Reagan National Security Staff at the time of the Evil Empire, who was a, uh, absolutely no fan of the Soviet Union and you know, kind of very critical of Russia, he was also opposed to the enlargement of NATO for these similar reasons that it would lead to more confrontation and that we ought to find a different way of handling it. Thank you. Handling Can that you is just... security concerns of Poland, the Baltic states, you know, and other countries. Thank you. <laughs> Can you describe the root causes of polarization in the United States? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of root causes, right? I mean, any tree, any plant has many roots feeder roots and, you know, larger roots. Um, they're, um, th as I describe in the book, and a lot of these are related to, you know, the fast change in the economy. Uh, it's not all because of that as well, because we've had a very fast changing demography, uh, demographic situation um, as well. So we're in a period of accelerated change. And a lot of people have a very hard time keeping up with that. I mean, I experienced that <clears throat> in the United Kingdom as well. When change on all different fronts happens very quickly, a lot of people then do feel disaffected. They wanted to stop, particularly if they feel that they're going to lose their position in society, either you know because of their job um, or because of their you know particular group um, identity and group uh, prominence, um, and also um, you know very much because they can't see a, a path in the future, you know, for themselves and their you know, and their children and grandchildren. So I lay out in the book a number of uh, of these factors around the you know whole theme of deindustrialization. Because, you know, from 1989 onwards, when I came to the United States, I saw immediately, you know, around in Boston, deindustrialization and then post-industrial decline. But places like Boston and parts of Massachusetts bounced back really quickly. Not, or not, but, but not everywhere in Massachusetts did. If you go out to Western Massachusetts and the old textile industries, for example, a lot of people are still left behind. It's all those places that did not adapt and were not able to adapt and were not helped to adapt to the new economy. I mean, you know, where you're sitting out in um, California, I mean, California adapted pretty well, right? But I mean, now you're facing other kinds of sets of problems that will be very difficult to adapt to. But to the changes in the economy, the emergence of the knowledge economy, you know, most of California, you know, did adapt, but you've still got a lot of tensions there. The people who can't find a house, can't, don't have an access to an education, they've been priced out of the economy. I mean, all of these, you know, inequalities, the indices of inequality, the lack of opportunity are all still there, and they also feed grievance and a backlash, you know, as we saw recently in, uh, in California politics. So, I mean, the point of this is, yes, we can, we can see all of these routes, I you know, certainly can, and I lay a lot of them out in the book, but they're all, you know, the, the, there's multiple different things at play here. And I use the theme of opportunity to describe these, because one of the biggest dividing lines in America right now about how you will vote, how you see yourself, how you describe yourself is education. And whether you've finished high school or you've then gone on to higher education in some fo some form, so you know we know that all the cleavages in America are really on this issue and on this uh, dividing line on education. Those who have a college education, those who have not, and that's really affecting all of our politics today. And you know, one of the arguments in the book is that we have to open up educational opportunities for as large a swathe of the population as possible. And that was actually an imperative because it ties into our politics as well, into disinformation and the ability of, you know, kind of outside forces to exploit us as well. If people are better informed, people are better educated uh, in the sense that they're able to have critical thinking and, you know, kind of be able to more discern information that they're getting. You know, we have a much more healthy 
political system. Thank you. Putin claimed that the U.S. has hundreds of military bases overseas, while Russia has merely two. If only somewhat accurate, does this gross imbalance not suggest that Russia hardly is a foreign relations threat, at least not militarily? Yeah, well, look, I mean, foreign relations threat, national security threat. I mean, Russia remains, it's not just the issue of bases, it's the nuclear arsenal. I mean, I mean no matter, you know, what you might think about where Russia is today, Russia is still the, you know, the, the power that has the capacity to annihilate us, just as we have, you know, for, for Russia with our strategic um, nuclear arsenal. I think actually the greatest threat from Russia today is not military bases or, you know, the posture of its nuclear forces even, it's this kind of more insidious threat, this sort of subversive threat, the kind of thing that we saw in 2016, the political influence operations, the propaganda. And there's one thing that really has um, an incredibly explosive effect in, in all uh, respects, which is the use of finance, dirty money. We've just re recently had, and I encourage people to go out and read, you know, and Doyle and others have you know, been covering this, the Pandora Papers the exposure of um, huge caches of documents, uh, basically describing the setting up of shell companies and the way that you know, uh, people hide you know, finances in shell companies. And you know, uh, a lot of this facilitates influence, political influence. I mean, in the United States, money is described as free speech as a result of the Citizens United you know, ruling at the Supreme Court. You can set up a political action committee and you can use an enormous amounts of money to sway opinion and to press your interests. And that's what Putin uh, does and the, and the um, security services. They set up their equivalent of a political action committee, a super PAC, and they put money you know, into our system through intermediaries and proxies by putting people on the boards of uh, their companies, you know, for example, and, and getting influence that way. Dirty money bribes, you know, kind of paying for things. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've talked a lot about Russians buying you know, property in Trump Towers, you know, kind of Russians, this is not regular Russians and even regular Russian businessmen, but oligarchs who are close to the Kremlin and sloshing money around. So like dirty money in our system, including our own corruption and the susceptibility of our own politicians to corruption. I mean, these are even more of a dangers and more of a threat to our society and to our future than, you know, however many tanks, you know, Russia may have on a base or even, you know, how many missiles, because these um, factors are more likely to be used and to use to ill effect. Ransomware attacks, you know, for example, you know, you don't have to have a missile to take down a hospital system. You can take a ransomware attack uh, by a criminal group that, you know, is being given the nod and the, you know, the wink to by the Russian secret services, and then the whole system is taken down. People have died because of that. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things that we should be thinking about rather than just the you know the sort of conventional military posture, although that is still important, and I don't want to you know I'm not diminishing you know the point of the question. I'm saying there are more things here that we should need to be paying attention to. Thank you. One final quick question before I turn it back to Doyle: Does Putin enjoy 007 movies, and do you enjoy James Bond films? Well, I haven't had a chance to see the new one yet, but I bet Putin does, because I mean just look at the way that you know he tries to dress, um, you know the aviator sunglasses and you know the jacket, and actually. You know, if, if, if Daniel Craig hadn't beefed up so much, <laughs> you know, I could see Daniel Craig playing Vladimir Putin in a kind of, you know, biopic of, of Putin's life. Um, I'm sure Putin would flattered. be very flattered by that. He would be very flattered, but I said if he wasn't quite so beefed up. In fact, there is a series, Archangelsk, which is about um, a professor, you know, looking for Stalin's lost son. It's actually a really good series. Daniel Craig um, is the star in it and is skinnier Daniel Craig, <laughs> you know, before he becomes the sort of like uh, the super bond, you know, that we see today. And he looks strikingly like Vladimir Putin in, in that series. So I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that um, Putin loves Jim Bond films. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I really like them. <laughs> My favorite, well, of course, uh, is Dan Chazem, but, you know, she's being killed off now. Oh. Uh, well, Dr. Hill, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. Uh, for our audience, I'll put a link to your book in the chat. And uh, Doyle, thanks again for leading today's discussion. I'll turn this back over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Well, th thank you, Jessica. Thank, thank you, Fiona. Uh, the book is called, once again, There Is Nothing For You Here. It has every topic we talked about, except perhaps Daniel Craig, skinny uh, <laughs> or not. Uh, and it has more, including an absolutely riveting description of growing up poor in the north of England. So I, I commend it to everyone. Uh, so I want to thank uh, thank our, our 
our very patient audience from the World Affairs Council and uh, Andrea Grossman and uh, my old Stanford classmate, Kim McCleary LaFrance, and uh, turn it back to you. Just as long as we don't say what year it was, right, Doyle? <laughs> I love it. Dr. Hill, this was such an extraordinarily important conversation. We are so honored. Andrea Grossman, the founder and CEO of Writer's Block, and I are just thrilled to have you both here. And Doyle, I know you've moderated for us so frequently. We have to have you both back very soon. Oh, thanks. I would love to come back in person as well. I mean, it's been, it's always great doing something with you. And thanks, Kim and, and Andrea and Jessica and everyone else as well. And obviously, Doyle, it's always great to see you. And I hope I can see you in person too someday. And as uh, Jessica said, please buy Dr. Hill's book. Um, our bookseller partner is Skylight Books. And as Jessica said, you can click on our chat in your control panel and find out how to purchase the book. For our audience, thank you so very much for joining us today. Both Writer's Block and the World Affairs Council Town Hall are partnering to provide you with these quality programs at no charge. So please consider making a donation to support each of our organizations. It's very easy. Our websites are provided for you on the last page of this program, as well as in the follow-up email. So please consider visiting our websites and making a donation to keep us going. We can't do this without you. Thanks for joining us today. Take care, have a great weekend.